The two new big points to address for today's grammar lecture are tense aspect mood as it applies to participles and verbs plus pronouns. TAM here is an acronym for tense aspect mood, so let's look at that as it pertains to participles. Here's the chart that you've seen so far. I describe this dichotomy in the language uh, between katal va yektol and yektol va katal. Today we can add participles to the mix here. Specifically, I'm talking about predicate participles. So when a participle is acting predicatively, then like a verb, what kind of tense aspect mood information does it encode? First, I don't believe participles actually encode any tense information, and this being distinct from katal and yiktol verbs, where the time of the participle action is relative, specifically concurrent with the context, be it past tense context, present context, or future context, participles here can be used in many different ways. And in any given context, basically. The aspect information of the participle is that it describes a continuous and ongoing action, and it has indicative mood. It describes an action that happened or is happening. Let's look at some examples here. So number one is an example of a use of a participle in a past tense context. Moshe haya roe tson Va yigil Adonai et ozno. So Moses was shepherding, where this is our participle form, shepherding a flock, and Yahweh uncovered his ear, where this second clause with gala plus ozen is a Hebrew idiom for uh, revealed something to him. So looking back here, hayagro a, this is our participle statement, and it's relative to the context here with the vayiktol form. Specifically, it's concurrent with it, meaning that Moses was shepherding a flock when Yahweh uncovered his ear. And this is why the writer didn't use a katal form for shepherding or a vayiktol form. If it was katal, you could say Moshe ra'a tzon. So Moses shepherded a flock and Yahweh revealed something to him. But that would make it sound like Moses did his shepherding thing and later on Yahweh revealed something to him. But the point is here in this is that Moses was doing his shepherding thing one day when Yahweh revealed something to him. Number two is in the use of the participle in a future tense context. Hini omed al hatsur ve'ata hake vatsur. Behold, I am standing on the rock and you strike the rock. Now I said future tense context. This is Yahweh speaking to Moses and he's giving him a list of commands and then you get this participle statement followed by another command. And so this participle statement is concurrent with this command which hasn't happened yet. Moses is to strike the rock, but he hasn't done it yet. So I think the point is, behold, I will be standing on the rock when you, Moses, must strike the rock. And that concurrent action point of Yahweh standing on the rock when Moses strikes the rock, that becomes a very important exegetical detail in interpreting the story. I don't have any examples in any stories to this point of use of the participle as a present tense verb, um, even though in class that's how we've mainly been using participles. And the reason is because in class the concurrent action with the context, the context is the speech act which is currently happening. So if I'm speaking and I say, Ani Omed, 
then the standing is happening concurrently with the speaking, meaning I am standing now. And so it makes it can make sense to you now why we use so many participles in class for present tense, even though you won't actually see all that many participles in the Hebrew Bible. The reason being that especially if you want a participle as a present tense, then you'll only ever get it when characters speak. And how often do you get characters speaking about what they're currently doing? Next, we have verbs plus pronouns, where when a pronoun attaches to the end of a verb, it functions as the direct object of that verb. Just as a little review here, here is a set of pronouns. These are called subject pronouns, and they're always written independently of any other word. They're, it's its own word when it shows up. Uh, you see it just as that and functions as the subject of the verb. Here's another set of pronouns that are the object pronouns. And again, they're written independently of any other word. Uh, and how they're formed is you just take your um, attached pronoun and you add it on to et, the direct object marker. When that happens, the e-type vowel of et becomes an o-type vowel in every form except for the second person plural forms. Now, this is one way that you can write object pronouns. Um, the other way that you can do it is you can just straight up take these attached pronouns and add them onto the verbal form itself. When that happens, this is how they're written. It's pretty much exactly like the uh, attached pronouns as you've seen them so far with some slight differences. So, for instance, this form is usually chirik yod, but here you have a nun attached. Usually you see this as o, but an alternate form is hu. Usually you see this as a, but you have an alternate form ha. The other difference is most of the attached pronouns that you've seen usually begin with a vowel type, but here pretty much all the forms begin with a consonant. And the reason is because these attach to verbs which typically end in a vowel most of the time. And in Hebrew, you can't have two vowel sounds in a row. You need a vowel followed by a consonant. So that's why these attached pronouns look the way they do. Let's look at some examples here of these attached pronouns on verbal forms. So in line three, you have the phrase, they will serve me, which could have been written like this, ya'av du ot, where you have the yiktol form, they will serve, and the object pronoun ot. But the way that it's written in the story is you have the attached pronoun for me attaches to the verbal form itself, Ya'av duni, where they will serve me, where one change that you may not have expected is this shurik is written as a kibitz. And this kind of way of writing vowels is very common. It's pronounced the same. So this is a good form for a good reason why you should always read your Hebrew out loud, especially at the beginning. Just train your ears. Your eyes may get uh, tricked, but your ears shouldn't in this case. Number four is another example. Uh, in line 12, you have the phrase, they will stone me, which could have been written with a yiktol and an object pronoun, yiskelu ot, but what you get is the attached pronoun goes on directly to the verbal form itself, yiskeluni, where, look again, the shurik is written as a kibitz. Number five is a pretty fun example. In line 13, you have, and he answered him, which could have been written like this, the who ana oto, and he answered him. Another way we could have written this is with uh, these two forms combined as a vayiktol verb, vayaan oto, and he answered him. But what ends up happening in the story is you get this object pronoun attached to the verbal form itself. So all of this in one word, vayaanehu. Or look at that, a pretty complex Hebrew form, which is very impressive. Okay, next, collective singular nouns. 
this is where you have a noun that is plural and referent even though it's singular in form. For example, you have an English team and faculty. And for the most part in English, when you have one of these nouns, they agree with a singular verb. For example, the team is in the locker room. Nobody says the team are in the locker room, where is is singular, are is plural. For example, he is, they are. Now, by and large, that's the case, but sometimes, and I think it's word specific, these uh, words occur with plural verbs. For example, to my ear, it sounds better, the faculty are in a meeting rather than the faculty is in a meeting. But this is about Hebrew grammar, where these nouns can take, by and large, they can take either singular verb agreement or plural verb agreement. And many times, as is the case here, they can take both singular and plural for uh, verb agreement in the same context. I'll read. Vayevk ha'am lifne Moshe vayomeru, where you have singular up front. The people, here's our collective singular noun, the people wept, singular, vayiktol form, before Moses, and they, plural, said. Another vayiktol form, but this time it's plural. And this uh, alternation between singular and then plural with the same subject for both of them, this happens all the time in Hebrew. And so my point here is that it just happens. I can't really explain to you why it happens. Um, it's a problem for the syntax of why it happens. It's not so much a problem for semantics because semantics... Um, these nouns in one sense, they're one entity, so it makes sense for singular verb agreement, but then they're an entity consisting of many individuals. So plural verb agreement also makes sense. And finally, two senses of with. Here are two words that you've learned, and here are what the entries look like in the English companion. Im means with, and b, one of the things it can mean is with which maybe has caused you to ask, Jesse, how, how would I know how to use one word and not the other? Well, I have the answer. The answer is that there are two different senses of with, two completely different uses. You can have with of accompaniment and with of instrument, whereas most languages have two different words, as does Hebrew for this, but English just has one. So number seven is with of accompaniment, which in Hebrew is im. I ate pancakes with my wife. So accompaniment, my wife is in my company and we're eating pancakes together. Number eight is with of instrument, which in Hebrew is b. I ate pancakes with a fork, where the fork is the instrument by which I'm eating pancakes instead of my fingers, let's say. Now, it becomes humorous if when you're speaking, you get these two senses of with mixed up. For example, if I said the with of instrument, b, in the context of seven, I ate pancakes, b, my wife, it would sound like I've picked up my wife and I'm using her as a fork or something, or I commandeered her arm and am making her feed me pancakes. Or to get it switched around the other way, if you use im, the with of accompaniment, in context eight, I ate pancakes im, a fork, it would make it sound like, I don't know, maybe I'm in uh, Beauty and the Beast, and the fork has sat down next to me, and, you know, it's alive there in the castle, and so here I am, me and the fork, and we're eating pancakes together at the table. So that's the story. There's two different senses of with, which is why in Hebrew you get two different words. Im is with of accompaniment, and ba is with of instrument.